is in this place. I can feel his mighty power. in this place as we gather together to worship today. Thank you for being here. Uh, if you have not filled out an attendance card, I encourage you to do that. I uh, also encourage you to have one of the handouts this morning because there's lots of news and information you're going to want to be aware of both today and all through the week. Um, lots of things happening in this congregation and lots of opportunities for each of us to serve others um, and bring glory and honor to our Lord and Savior Jesus and His Father. If you'd like to, let's stand as we continue to sing. Hallelujah, praise Jehovah, from the heavens praise His name, praise Jehovah in the highest, all His angels praise proclaim, all His souls together praise Him, sun and moon and stars on high. to you today we come to honor and glorify and praise you lord we thank you for jesus and his sacrifice on the cross that we are able to gather in his name and come before you lord to sing praises and to uh, pray before you and to hear a message from your word to learn and to grow and to uh, come closer to you and to come closer to each other lord we ask that you put upon our hearts 
as we worship today to just clear all of the things of our minds and all the things uh, of this world that pull us away and keep us distracted. Lord, we seek to praise you. We seek to worship you. We seek to fellowship together and grow uh, as your children and as a family here. Lord, we ask you to help focus our minds on that, to help us keep directed towards you, to clear our minds of all the things of this world. And in your son's name we pray. Amen. detail of scripture. Uh, one of my favorite things to do is to get uh, in a class or read a book or something, watch a video that, that tells me some little nuance or some little uh, nugget of information that I'd never heard before. Maybe some Old Testament prophecy that links back to something in the New Testament or to explain something that I'd never thought of. And, and I can very quickly drill down into those details and just get lost in the weeds, so to speak. Uh, I've been listening to and reading some of N.T. Wright, and if you know him, he's about as complex as they get. He's a, a writer, uh, talks about things like that. But one of the things that he would also say is, don't forget that there's a big story here, too. Uh, I can, you know, think about all the theological complexities about how a, an all-powerful God created something from nothing and how he chose to create beings with free will and then after the fall that corrupted all of mankind he chose to bring his own son into the world and put on flesh and how that somehow redeems us there's a lot going on there a lot of theological detail a lot of old testament prophecy a lot of things that you can really get into the weeds on but at the end of the day if you boil it down, God's word is just a story about his family and how he loves us and how he wants us to be part of that family. There's a short passage in Ephesians chapter 1, two verses, or three verses, verses 4 through 6, and out of the easy-to-read version, it sounds like this. In Christ, he chose us before the world was made. He chose us in love to be his holy people, people who could stand before him without any fault. And before the world was made, God decided to make us his own children through Jesus Christ. That was what God wanted, and it pleased him to do it. And this bring pra brings praise to God because of his wonderful grace. God, had, God gave that grace to us freely. He gave us that grace in Christ, the one he loves. God calls us this morning to be part of his family. It's not complicated. He loves us. He desires to be with us. And as we gather around this table this morning, He is in our presence. Let's pray together. Father, we are so thankful for the simplicity of Your Gospel. It can be boiled down to just one thing, Jesus Christ. We are thankful for His love for us. We are thankful for His sacrifice for us. And we're thankful for the unity that we can enjoy as we commune with each other and with him. 
as we are bound together as part of your family through Christ. Father, this morning as we take this bread, we remember the body that Christ put on as part of his work to reconcile us to you. We are thankful that he was willing to do that for us and to break his own body on that cross. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's pray together again. Father, we are thankful for the cup that we are about to pass and share and for what it represents to us. That is the blood of our Savior, Jesus Christ, that he freely gave to reconcile each of us to you. Thank you for that wonderful blessing. In Jesus' name, amen.
Let's pray together. Our most gracious Heavenly Father, we're so thankful for this day and for the many blessings that you've given us with it. We're especially thankful for this opportunity that we have to assemble together and sing songs of praise to you and lift your name on high. Heavenly Father, as we reflect back on the many blessings that you bestow upon us each and every day of our lives, we pray that you would bless each of us and watch over us. As we prepare to give back a portion, just a meager portion, Father, of what you give us daily. And help us to do so in a manner that's pleasing to you and with a cheerful heart. For it's through your Son's holy name we pray. Amen. for Jared Massey this morning. <laughs> He's in Oklahoma. We talked last Sunday night. He said, uh, he said, I got them primed and ready for next week for you. I said, well, all afternoon I've gotten calls complaining about how short the sermon was. <laughs> I said, we can't have that anymore. And Jimmy Mullins told me this morning, he said, I didn't even <laughs> nod off one time last week. <laughs> Smart Alex in the church, I'll tell you. <laughs> Maria, if he nods off, poke him today. It is good to be back. You know, Jared, he's a pro now, and he, uh, he told me, he said, uh, what, what are you preaching on Sunday? And I, I told him, I said, I'm going to talk a little about selfishness. And he said, uh, he said, let me, let me look over it for you. So, so I, I handed it to him, and 
And uh, he took it with him, and he read over it, and he said, he said, Charles, I, there's something here. He said, I really think you need to work this down a little bit, make it to where someone in high school can understand it. I said, oh, it's okay, Jerry. So I worked on it. He said, let, let me see it back. So I emailed it over to him, and he looked at it again, and he said, I... He said, Charles, I'm telling you, he said, he said you, you need to narrow this down a little bit. You need to work on it so that a grade school kid could understand it. And I was like, okay. So I worked on it and, uh, you know, I, I narrowed it down a little bit, got it, you know, cleared up some language and I emailed it back over to him. He said, Charles, I, he said, really? He said, I'm telling you, somebody in preschool needs to understand. I finally, I said, Jared, what part of this do you not understand? <laughs> I told him I was not waiting, waiting until next week to get him back. Uh, if you've got a Bible, go ahead and open it to 1 Corinthians chapter 13. We've been looking at this for a while. Uh, it says uh, number 8 on here. Honestly, I don't know how many I've preached out of this. We just put number 8. We're going to keep going until we get through these verses. Um, but each one of these lessons has a different slant to it. So we're not talking about the same thing every week, although... You know, what's interesting about these lessons is it's important for us to remember we're talking about how we function as a family. You know, there are moments where we will just pause and look at ourselves personally, how, how it affects uh, our relationships outside of the church. But we want to get back and look at how we function in the church, how our love looks as we live with one another in the church. And really, that's how this particular lesson <coughs> Uh, these lessons, this particular scripture uh, has been written. And so today we're looking specifically at 1 Corinthians 13 verse 5 where love does not seek its own. As a matter of fact, that's the way that uh, it's worded in scripture. The NIV also says it is not self-seeking. Think about your life in the church. What does your life look like in the church? Is it, is it all about self? Is it looking at your own interest? Ignoring the interest of others? The New Living Translation has that it does not demand its own way. The ESV is the same, worded the same as the New Living Translation. Does not demand its own way. Have you known people in church that are a little bit like that? Stacy, let me see that basketball for a moment. Got a referee handed me the basketball. Someone asked me, uh, said, oh, we've got a referee here today. Is he a good one? And I said, well, that might be a contradiction in terms, right? Is there a good referee? I don't know. <laughs> Stacy would be a good one if there is. He would be a great one if there is. Uh, but I, I brought a basketball. I asked my kids this morning. I said, you got a basketball? And they, oh, yeah, Joe ran outside and he got his basketball. I said, well, I need it for church. Have you, uh, have you, have you had the mentality, maybe when you were small you did this, you got mad, mainly because you were selfish. And what'd you say? Taking my ball, and I'm going home. Right? How many of you done that? Let's be honest. How many of you, anybody? Some of you, maybe not with a basketball, you've done it with other stuff. Right? I, I'm selfish, and if it's not going my way, I'm just going to take it, and I'm going home. Right? That's the way we do. We take, well, we'll come back to this in a moment, because I think that really... This has a little bit of what Paul is saying in this letter to the Corinthians. Thank you, Stacey. We're going to take our ball. We're just going to go home. The proverbial, if, you, if it doesn't go my way, I'm not. Now, now, let me just say this. That there are moments where I would say that if you are not growing spiritually, look for a place where grass is being planted. Where you can feed and grow. We're not talking about, you know, opportunities where we want to just be in a better environment or we want to be in a growing environment. That, that's not what we're dealing with here. That's not what Paul is dealing with here. We're, we're talking specifically about someone who's demanding his or her own way. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take the proverbial ball and I'm going home if it doesn't go my way. If things don't happen the way that I want them to happen, then I'm going home. And I, I think that, again, this is what Paul is saying to the church. As we function together as a spiritual family, what really is your mentality? Is your mentality more about 
the interest of others, or is it always focused inwardly? I, I love what Albert Barnes said. He said, this is perhaps not a more, there is perhaps not a more striking or important expression in the New Testament than this. Or one that more beautifully sets forth the nature and power of that love which is produced by true religion. It is, it's evident meaning is that it's not selfish. It does not seek its own happiness exclusively or mainly. It, it does not uh, seek its own happiness to the injury of others. He would go on to say selfishness is the act of putting your own interest our personal gain above those of others. While it may seem like a harmless pursuit of personal gain, selfish, selfishness can cause damage to the relationship, communities, and one's relationship with God. Think about this for a moment. Who is one of the individuals, we're talking about the disciples that Jesus chose, who put his own interest above the interest of the group at large? who put his own interest uh, above the interest of the very one that he claimed to give allegiance to, Jesus Christ. You, you might remember that was Judas, right? Judas in Matthew 26, verses 14 through 16, was more about himself, was more about seeking his own way than the way of the group at large. He was more selfish, we might say. Not looking for the interest of others, but looking out for his own interests. Uh, many of you, I, I, I'm pretty sure I've shared this illustration here before, but it just works perfectly for this. And I, I want to share this uh, little illustration to try to help us to see a little bit about how we are by nature. You heard about the two friends who went to a restaurant together and they were going to an all-you-can-eat catfish uh, buffet. And as a matter of fact, they sat down, the waitress, she comes and she takes their drink orders, and she says, I'll bring you out some fish and fries in just a few moments. And, and she comes back out with her drinks, and then a few minutes later she comes out and she says, well, uh, I want you to know we're running a little short. I just had a couple of pieces. I brought those out for you. Uh, uh, just be patient with us. We're going to get more. And so, you know, these two friends, they're sitting there, and they're looking at one another. And one of the pieces of fish is a bigger piece of fish, and the other one's a little bit smaller. And so one of the friends, he just grabs the spatula and he, he reaches over and he grabs the small piece of fish and he puts it on his friend's plate and he takes the big piece of fish and he scoops it out and puts it on his plate. And the other friend's just looking at him and says, well, you've got some nerve, don't you? He said, well, what do you mean? He said, well, you gave me the small piece of fish and you took the big piece of fish. He said, I just can't believe you did that. He said, well... What would you have done? He said, well, if I were doing it, he said, I would have taken the spatula and I would have put the small piece of fish on my plate and I would have put the big piece of fish on your plate. He said, well, I got it. <laughs> you know, we, don't, we really don't need a lesson in selfishness, do we? Looking out for our own interests. I mean, follow us around for a little while and you'll start to see that we're more about self than we are others. And certainly you can imagine for a moment how this dynamic might work in the church if everyone were looking out only for their own interests. Would be a hard group to get along with, wouldn't you, wouldn't you agree? Would you say that a lot of the problems that we struggle with in church, in church life, a lot of the church struggles deal in some way with this aspect? You know, have a building committee. Talk about the color of carpet. You want to cause division real quick in the church? I don't like green. I'd rather have, I'd rather have red. I mean, people start to argue about color uh, that, that are on the walls. And, and I'll tell you, strong opinions can prevail. And division can happen over some of the most senseless things. Well, we want to update this. Oh, no, don't do that. There's a lot of history here. You want to talk about stepping on feelings? Start talking about change. And I will tell you, you will see that we will look out not only for the interest of others, we will look out for our own interests. 
went through a building program at the Fulcher Church of Christ where we lived in Fulcher, Texas. When we first started there, we were uh, in, a, in a gym. We were meeting in a gym. There were about, I don't know, 75 to 80 people. We ended up growing, and uh, the church already had property. We were going to build a building. Everyone was excited about the building. Everyone was excited that we were going to build a brand new church building, multi-million dollar facility. Exciting times, right? Until the group got together and decided, well, we want this or we want that. And then you started to see there, were a little, there was some division. I'm using a very simple illustration. Let it get a little more pointed. and We can bristle up. We can show that we're more interested in our own interest than also for the interest of others. Do you realize that people will stop going to church over the color of carpet? I never thought I would say that in the church, but that is certainly true. That's not the issue that Paul is dealing with in Corinth. It's not about church color, carpet. It's not about the color of the walls. You know, they were meeting in homes. And that was a personal decision. But what about when they start collectively meeting? Again, think about this for just a moment. The way of Christianity, the way of, of what we learn about Jesus, the way uh, that God communicates in Scripture, think about this. We're supposed to love one another as we love ourselves. Love one another. Jesus changes the dynamic in John 13, 34, and 35. As I have loved you. We are to serve one another and we're to put the needs of one another before our own needs. We are to act selflessly and not selfishly. We are to follow the way of Christ. And so, so Paul is looking at the landscape in the church at Corinth and he's starting to see that there are some issues that are bubbling up in the church. And these issues that are bubbling up in the church... Uh, are starting to cause division and problems. As a matter of fact, he learns that at the beginning of this letter that was written to him about how there is dissension and division. But he goes on to talk about in this particular letter about how we need to deny ourselves. Where do you think that Paul learned that lesson of self-denial from? Now, now, Understand that Paul was not one who walked with Jesus the way the uh, twelve did. Paul was one born out of due season. Uh, but nonetheless, Paul had an experience and met Jesus on the road to Damascus. But, but think about what the twelve had heard from Jesus about this selfless living. As a matter of fact, in Matthew chapter 16, verses 24 through 27... You remember right after Peter makes that good confession, you're the Christ, the son of the living God, Jesus starts to talk about how he's going to die on a cross. He's going to be buried and he's going to be raised the third day. And what's Peter say? No way. This will not happen to you. And you remember it's one of the few times in Scripture that Jesus actually says something like this. He looks at Peter, one of the ones that he personally selected, and says, Get behind me, Satan. You're not mindful of God, uh, the things of God, but really you're thinking about the things of men. I, I think to put it more mildly, Peter, you're looking at your own interests. You're not looking at the interest of others. Now think about how that statement Lord, this, this is not going to happen to you. I'm not going to let this happen to you. Flies in the face of the very purpose for which Jesus came. Why did Jesus come? Jesus came specifically to give us all what we could not get on our own, and that's salvation. And here's Peter saying, Lord, you're not going to do this. The very salvation that Peter needs is the way of the cross. It's through the death of the Savior. And Peter's saying, no, 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 not you, Lord. And Jesus says, you've got to get behind me because that's not thinking the way God thinks. What God wants is for everyone to be saved. God's not willing that any should perish. And, and Peter, the very salvation that he desperately needs comes through the very means that he's trying to stop. He's looking out for his own interest. 
not really understanding the greater picture at large. Salvation, the cross, what we need. You know what comes after this, right in those verses in Matthew 16, is where Jesus tells Peter, Peter, you got to deny your cross, yourself. You got to take up your cross. You got to follow me. The very reason Jesus gave those words is, Peter, you've got to let go of what you're thinking. You, you've got to let go of yourself and you've got to think more about others. You've got to think more about me. You've got to deny yourself, take up your cross and follow me. Jesus says something very similar in Luke chapter 9 beginning with verses tw uh, verse 23 through verse 26. If any man would come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross and follow me. If you want salvation, you've got to lose yourself in Jesus. You will find yourself in the salvation and blood that Jesus provides. This is one of the, I think, things that has been discussed already in 1 Corinthians chapter 10. You know, you know this idea of, of, of coming in this uh, line of what love does not look like, it does not look self-seeking, this is not just pinned by chance. It's not that Paul just thought, you know what, here's what I think needs to happen. What I think needs to happen is we need to think about all of these beautiful things that describe love, and let's just write that down. Oh, that sounds great. That sounds great. I think we got it. It looks good. That's going to look great on, on some, uh, uh, with some stencil on a wall. That, that's going to look wonderful on a t-shirt. No, that wasn't what Paul was thinking. Paul didn't give us this so we could have some cute little thing to put on our uh, mantle about 1 Corinthians 13 and love. No, this was already a challenge, as we mentioned a moment ago, in the Corinthian letter. And in chapter 10, we see it. As a matter of fact, uh, in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, uh, look at verse 23. All things are lawful for, for me, but not all things are helpful. In other words, I might have some permission to do certain things. But that doesn't mean that it's helpful for the greater cause or even helpful in the church. Let no one, look at this verse 24. If you want to underline a verse in 1 Corinthians 10. Let no one seek his own, but each one the other's well-being. Now, he's been talking, he will <laughs> even talk more about this idea of eating meat. Some people struggled over this. Sh should we eat meat that's offered to an idol? And Paul's words are, be careful. You know, there's only one God. There's no, these, these false gods, that, so there's nothing really wrong with it. But if it violates your conscience, don't do it. But what he gives, he gives the same answer to both groups. He, he gives the same answer. He says to those who struggle with it, listen, don't seek your own. Seek the interest of others. And the ones who think, well, it's okay, he says to them, you know what? You might find some liberty here, but, but just don't seek your own. Look out for the interests of others. How does this affect the body of Christ? So in verse 25, for whatever is sold in the meat market, ask no questions for conscience sake. It's better just to not know. Just go ahead and eat the meat. For the earth is the Lord's and all the fullness. If any of those who do not believe invites you, some non-Christian invites you to eat dinner, and you desire to go, eat whatever is set before you, asking no questions for conscience sake. Well, I think what Paul's saying here is it's about the meat, right? It's not about personal preference per se. You know, just don't ask any questions. Hey, was this meat sold at the market? Was this meat that had been offered in uh, idolatrous sacrifice? He said, don't ask those questions. When you go over to your non-believing friend's house, sit down and eat. Don't worry about, what, where, about the meat. Verse 28, but if anyone says to you this was offered to idols, do not eat it for the sake of the one who told you and for conscience sake. Again, he quotes the same verse. For the earth is the Lord's and all its fullness. Conscience. I say not your own. But that of the other. Here again, he reiterates. Look out for the interest of others. For why is my liberty judged by another man's conscience? 
I, I think, you know, we have to be careful with this because we want to keep our finger on the pulses of one another's sensitivities, right? But just because someone is sensitive doesn't mean that all of those who are sensitive about issues hold the rest of us hostage. I mean, he, he says you be careful for conscience sake. But at the same time, understand there's liberty with some of these issues as well. Don't be judged by another man's uh, conscience. Verse 30, but if I partake with thanks, why, why uh, am I e evil? Spoken of for the food over which I give thanks. Verse 31, therefore, whether you eat or drink, whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. Give no offense either to the Jews or to the Greeks or to the church of God. So in, in this particular sense, it, it's more than just the church of God. It's, it's also how we interact and react outside of the church. Verse 33, here, here it is again. Paul's going to say this about himself. Just as I also please men in all things, not seeking my own profit, but the profit of many, that they may be saved. Paul says... I, I've become all things to all men so that I by all means might save some. The, the idea here is I'm going to be careful because salvation is the more important thing. Again, Paul is talking about giving up rights here. Now, I, I want to share two specific passages before I give you a couple of points to walk home with. And these two passages are, I think, extremely important. The, the man who said... Uh, in this particular passage, you know, look out for the interest of others. Don't si love does not seek its own. Again, he gets that from the very example of Jesus. The same man who says love does not seek its own, when he's writing the church at Philippi, he says this very thing. He says, I want you to look at what selfless love looks like. As a matter of fact, he says, let nothing be done through selfish ambition. Let's just stop there for a moment. Look at that first point. Let nothing be done. Wow. You look out for the interest of every, everyone else. Don't, don't do something because you're selfish in the church. Let nothing be done through selfish ambition or conceit. And then notice how he goes on to show the example of Jesus. But in lowliness of mind, let each esteem others better than himself. Look out for the interest of others. Not only for your own interests, but also for their interests as well. It's about looking broadly at the church. How do my actions... How does my opinion on this matter? How does it affect the church? Now, one thing I want to make sure that you understand I'm not saying and that Paul's not saying is that we ever overlook the Word of God. Well, the group at large wants it, so let's just jump headlong into it. No, if it contradicts the Word of God, Paul would never agree with that. Paul would never say, let's just ignore the Word of God because th this direction is a largely or bold direction we want to go in. He's not saying that. What he is saying is when it doesn't contradict the word of God, if there's liberty here, then let's just be careful about how we function with our liberty. Yeah, there are things that, that I think are okay that you might not think are okay. And there are things that you might think are okay that I don't think are okay. But here's what we're going to do. We're going to look out for the interest of others. I'm not going to demand my own way. He would go on to say, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. In other words, this is the way Jesus was. Who being in the form of God did not consider it robbery uh, with God a thing to be held on to or a thing to be grasped. But made himself. You see, when, when we're going to say we're not going to let anything be done through selfish ambition or conceit, there are moments where we have to deny ourselves. We need to make ourselves more consistent with the group at large. Made himself of no reputation, taking on the form of a servant and coming in the likeness of men and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even the death of the cross. You want to know what life looks like in the church? You want to know what real love looks like? 
It looks like selflessness and not selfishness. It looks like looking out for the interest of others and not only for my own personal interests. You know what's beautiful about this particular thought is, again, if you go just one chapter before chapter 10, where Paul does talk about this issue of eating meat, he uses himself. This is just, this is beautiful. Paul will use himself. Now, as I read through this, I want you to understand Paul's obviously addressing something that more than likely was personally stated about him. Okay? Maybe others were talking about this, about Paul. And so Paul addresses it. But I, I think he addresses it for the purpose of saying, you know what? There are moments where we just have to deny ourselves. There, there, there are moments where we have liberties but we don't exercise those liberties. Notice this in chapter 9, beginning with verse 1. He says, I, am I not an apostle? Well, of course he was. These are rhetorical questions. The answer is yes, it's assumed. Am I not free? I would say, isn't that true of all of us? Aren't we free in Jesus? Am I not free? He goes on to say, have, have I uh, not seen Jesus Christ our Lord? Are you not my work in the Lord? Am I not an apostle to others? Yet doubtless I am to you. Other people may be denying this fact, but you certainly could give credibility to this cause. If I'm not, a man, I'm not an apostle to others, yet doubtless I am to you, for you are the seal of my apostleship in the Lord. He says, my defense to those who examine me, again, I think this was what was being stated, is this, do, not, do we not have a right to eat and drink? Again, that's what he's dressing in chapter 10. Yeah, we have a right to eat and drink. Uh, do we not have a right to take along a believing wife? Well, yeah, we've got a, a right to do that, as do the other apostles. I mean, there's nothing that says I can't be married, Paul's saying. He says the brothers of the Lord and Cephas do that, right? These are all personal liberties. In other words, there's no book, chapter, and verse that says I can't have a wife. There's no book, chapter, and verse that says I can't eat and drink. No, these are personal liberties. Or is it only Barnabas and I that have no right to, uh, have a right to refrain from working? Now, Paul was a tent maker. Paul supplied his own living. But what he's going to say is, I have a right to make a living off of the church. Whoever goes to war... Does he do it at his own expense? No, he's paid for his service. Who plants a vineyard and does not eat of its fruit? I mean, every farmer that plants a vineyard has a right to go pick some of the fruit and eat it. He says, or who tends a flock and does not drink of the milk of the flock? Do I say these things as a mere man? Or does not the law also say the same thing? And then he's going to give an example of, he's going to make the case. Here's what the law says. The law says, you shall not muzzle an ox while he's treading out the grain. Why? Because while that ox is working, let him eat a little. He needs energy to work. He uses this very example in the Old Testament to make his case. But then what he does is he starts to say, but look at what I've done. I have these liberties, I have these rights. How many of us have rights? As Americans, we're conditioned to think about rights, right? Someone violates my rights, you're going to hear me talk about it. You know, I'm going to tell everybody, I've got rights. Well, Paul says, you play that game in the church, you're in trouble. Yeah, we have liberties and rights, but there are moments where we need to deny ourselves. <coughs> if others are partaker of this right over you, are we not even more? Nevertheless, we have not used this right, but endure all things lest we hinder the gospel of Christ. Yeah, there are moments where we need to be careful because if we're partaking of this right, if it affects others, and again, I think this is more about what he talks about in chapter 10 with the meats than it is anything else. Yeah, there's liberty to eat meats, but you have to be careful. Both sides have to be careful. He says, do you not know that the one who ministers the, uh, the holy things 
eat of the things of the temple. It goes back to the Old Testament, uses this example. Those who serve at the altar partake uh, of the altar, of, uh, of the thing, offerings of the altar. In other words, they share in what's being offered. Even so, the Lord has commanded that those who preach the gospel should live from the gospel. And again, Paul certainly uh, shares this example where uh, in Luke chapter 10, verse 7, the Lord says that very thing. I mean, he's, he's saying this is what the Lord said. But he says, have I used any of these things? Is this what I'm doing? Am I taking advantage of my liberties? Is that really what's going on here? Or am I being very careful because of this? He would say, basically, what I've done is I've denied myself of these rights and these liberties. So let me ask you again. As you function in the church, are you looking out for the interest of others? Have you, have you considered how what you're doing affects others in the church? Have you considered how your voice might contradict the conscience of another, not that that conscience is to hold you hostage, but how you need to be careful and considerate. Uh, certainly, I think Paul would say, you know, if, if we want to kind of narrow this down, love does not seek its own. First, look at yourself. Again, to the, to the basketball, Stacy. Yeah, to the basketball. Yeah, there we go. You're on cue, man. Thank you. Good job. You got to wake him up. Am I willing to share this with others? Am I willing to just play and have fun and, and uh, you know, experience the excitement and the laughter that a simple game? What about those Lincoln County ladies? How awesome was that? First time in school history. State playoff. I had to throw that in there. I was working on a moment to throw that in there. But is it, is it about... Is it about enjoying what we can enjoy together? Or, or what happens when we take the ball home? What, what happens when I take this ball home? What happens when I take this ball home and no one gets to play? There's no advantage of the blessing of this ball. And, and I think what Paul is saying is, I think what Paul is saying is, be careful, look at yourself. Introspectively, how are you functioning in the church? Is it about your preference? Is it about your way? Or are you looking at everyone else? I will tell you how you might try to look a little more introspectively. Look about your scope of friends. Look right in your own household. Does everything revolve around you? Is it about you only? Do your friends walk on eggshells knowing, well, we don't want to upset him or her? They're so sensitive. Be careful. Look out for the interest of others. And then think about Jesus. I think the message from Philippians 2 was everything about Jesus was about everyone else. That, that cross was not about Him. That, that cross was about everyone else. He was not looking out for His own interest. He was looking out for the interest of everyone else. Because if he were looking out for himself, there would be no cross. Peter says there was no, no deceit or guile found in his mouth. He was a sinless man. He kept the law perfectly. He was the only one who could stand justified before God. But you know what? It wasn't about him. It was about you and me. What Calvary says is that Jesus was looking out for God's interests. He was looking out for your interests and mine and not for himself. The very one that we are following says it's about everybody else. I, I think that's why Paul said in that passage in verse 33 in chapter 10 was, listen, I'm going to give up my personal rights because it's about the salvation of everyone else. Amen? You know, again, most of the church problems would go away if we would just look at Jesus. We would look at the cross. We'd say it's more, about, it's more about you and it's more about others. The cross speaks of selflessness, not selfishness. We think about how this would impact. Think about the church here at Washington Street. Look at the problems and possibilities. I mean, if we were to look at the, 
If we were to look at the problems that selfishness causes, can I ask you to think for a moment? Do you know of someone who's, because of their selfishness, it's affected someone else? Can anyone raise a hand here? But because of their selfishness, it affected someone else. Do, do you know that, that there are people who have been affected by the selfishness of others? That have stopped going to church? Now, now we all have personal responsibility. I'm, I'm not trying to blame someone's lack of commitment on, on another person. We all have personal responsibility. But, but we all know that it's true. <laughs> Think about the problems in the church. Have churches been divided over selfishness? Yeah. We probably know some in this town that that's happened to. Is that what Jesus wants? Have you read John 17? Have you read John 17 where Jesus said, I, Lord, and you, Lord, are one, and my prayer is that they may be one, and the only way that could be accomplished is if they focus on me, they focus on you, and they focus on others. And it's not about selfishness, but selflessness. And if that happens, look at the blessings, look at the promises, look at the experience of this church. You want a defining moment for this church? Look out not only for your own interests, but also the interests of others. Now can I tell you if we're ready to stand on that? then we're going to be an evangelistic church. Because if we're about looking at the interests of others, then what do I want for them? What do I want for them? I want salvation. I, I will tell you that there are people sitting right here this morning who are extremely selfish. And, and if we were to open this up for discussion, my family would say, you know what, the preacher is one of the first ones. There are some of us sitting here who are extremely selfish. We've got to get over ourselves. We are our own worst enemy. It takes a lot of selflessness and a lot of swallowing of the pride to walk forward and confess. When has your family seen you come to Jesus with a humble heart Depending only on Him for what you need. When's the last time that your family says, you know, has seen you say, you know what, it's not about me, it's about everyone else. And they need to see me humbly submit my life before the, the throne of Jesus Christ. And I hope that some see that today. I, I hope that you will deny yourself. You will take up your cross and walk to Jesus. As together we stand. As we stand.
this morning, Stacy Peterson, friend of Braden Mullins. She is battling cancer, and he would like us to pray for her. So, so we'll have a closing prayer now. Father, we are just so thankful for this uh, good day that you bless us with. Uh, we thank you for uh, the opportunity here to, to come together and worship you, to study your word. It's been pointed out this morning that uh, you, uh, your word, what Jesus did for us, was for our sakes and for, for not his. And we're just so thankful for Jesus and all that Jesus does for it. And those blessings go beyond the hope of heaven. They also um, uh, exist here and while we live this life. And we're just so thankful again, Father, that for all that Jesus has done for us. We uh, pray for this, uh, for Stacy Peterson as she battles cancer. We pray that you will bless her. Pray for others that are hurting. Just so we know a, a, in a crowd this big, there are people that are suffering. We just pray for each and every one of them. And as we have opportunity, Father, I pray we'll put ourselves aside and, and look to the needs of others. Just, uh, just uh, so thankful, Father, for, for your word and, and for Jesus. And again, all he's done for us. And go with us now as we leave this place. Uh, uh, temptations and uh, hardships do arise, but we know through Christ we can overcome all things, and it's in His name we pray. Amen.